Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We continue our study in Leviticus, called into the presence of the King, with this sermon entitled, The Peace Offering. We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. If his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, If he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar. And from the sacrifice of the peace offering as a food offering to the Lord, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering, which is on the wood on the fire. It is a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord is an animal from the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offers a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord, lay his hand on his on the head of his offering, and kill it in front of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's son shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then from the sacrifice of the peace offering, he shall offer as a food offering to the Lord its fat. He shall remove the whole fat tail, cut off close to the backbone, and the fat that covers the entrails, and all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys, with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. And the priest shall... Burn it on the altar as a food offering to the Lord. If his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord and lay his hand on its head and kill it in front of the tent of meeting. And the sons of Aaron shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then he shall offer from it as his offering for a food offering to the Lord. The fat covering the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. And the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering with a pleasing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places that you eat neither the fat nor the blood. So, so far in Leviticus, we have looked at two of the five offerings of of the first seven chapters of the book. And today, this morning, we're going to look at the peace offering or the the fellowship offering. Um, In Hebrew, it's the Zavah Shelomim. Um, Shelomim shares the, my Hebrew didn't post right, but anyway, uh, the little circle with the dots shouldn't be there. Um, in Hebrew, uh, Shalomim shares the same root as the word shalom, and that probably sounds a little bit more familiar to our ears. Um, you hear that as a greeting uh, a, a lot of times um, in Middle Eastern cultures. Uh, shalom means peace, prosperity, and wholeness. And so uh, that's why we call this the, the peace offering. And then zavah, uh, that is the word for sacrifice. And, and I want you to uh, notice, I don't know if you have noticed, but so far I've, I've tried to be pretty consistent in saying that these are offerings. Uh, this is the first time we hear the word sacrifice. And zavah is a communal sacrifice. Anytime in the Old Testament we see the word zavah, it is the idea of a uh, communal sacrifice where a meal is being had. And so it's loosely tied to the idea of a feasting. And so the Zavah Shalomim could loosely be translated as a peace 
feast. Um, and, and so you'll hear me call that um, and refer to that as such this morning. And we see this type of uh, covenantal communal meal often through the Old Testament. If you remember in our study in Genesis, in Genesis 26, when uh, <clears throat> Abimelech uh, makes a pact with Isaac, they share a meal. And we see in Genesis 26 when Abimelech uh, went to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his advisor, and Philco, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? And they said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us. They're making a covenant, covenant arrangement. Uh, let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm. <clears throat> Just as we have not touched you and have not done to you uh, nothing but good and have sent you away in peace, you are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast. And they ate and drank, and in the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths. And Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. And so uh, these peace feasts, uh, the peace offerings, the idea of having a, a meal uh, when you are making a covenant is a way of, of signing on the, the dotted line. And so uh, in contracts and things today, uh, when you go to a, a lawyer or you even you know go into a, a doctor a lot of times they'll have insurance forms and they'll say sign here and here and here at the x and, and this peace feast was a way of signing on the the dotted line uh, of saying we're in agreement uh, we're no longer hostile to each other we're no longer enemies uh, we are now in agreement we have an arrangement uh, we have fellowship with with one another there's uh, peace that exists between us and so the peace offering is the Third and final voluntary offering. Um, voluntary offerings are offerings that were not given for a specific offense or sin. And this is going to be different than what we will be talking about the next two weeks, which is the sin offering and the guilt offering, because those were offered when you sinned, when you messed up, when, when there was a, an offense that you committed against God. And you had that on your mind, you brought those offerings. But the voluntary offerings uh, were not for a specific uh, offense against God. And so uh, they're di distinct from the compulsory offerings of uh, the sin and the guilt offering. And so we have to remember again, uh, reframe this again, that God is teaching Israel and He's teaching us through rituals, through ceremonies and through play acting. And we talked in Sunday school this morning about how this is almost like if you had uh, Barbies or action figures, G.I. Joe, or I had Star Wars figures when I was little, and you would kind of go through motions and, and make up stories and get in the floor and, and play with those. And God, through uh, the Levitical priesthood, through these rituals that we see in Leviticus, is, is kind of getting down on the floor with us, and He's putting these ceremonies in place as like a, a play uh, for us to see and for us to learn about who He is and about who we are. And so the three voluntary offerings, uh, if you notice, there is a progression that happens in those. And so when we start with the burnt offering, uh, the theme of that offering is atonement and the fact that I, I need a substitute so I can come near to God. I need a brought near thing, a korban. And so then we moved from that, from the Olah offering to the Minha, uh, the Thanksgiving offering. And so now we can say, uh, I needed a substitute, and now God has provided a substitute so I can come near to God. I, I thank God for providing a substitute, for providing a way for me to enter into the, the presence of God. Uh, again, uh, the whole concept that we're seeing in Leviticus is God is dwelling in His royal palace tent with a people who are dwelling in tents. They're nomadic people. They're moving. So God is identifying with them, and He wants them to live in His presence, and He's made a way for them to do that. And then finally this morning, uh, with the Zavah Shalomim, uh, it's the fellowship or the peace offering. And so now we can celebrate our fellowship with God and with each other through a covenantal community meal. And so... Uh, the progression is, is stated again uh, in the text this morning. I, I don't know if you kind of picked up on this as Chip was reading that. Uh, I appreciate him reading for us this morning. Um, but in verse 5, if you noticed, 
God says the peace offering fat is burned on top of and after the daily burnt offering. And so every morning, if you remember when we talked about the burnt offerings, those were offered twice daily, uh, once in the morning and then once again in the evening. And if there was to be a peace offering made during the day, it came after the daily burnt offering. And so God again is saying, listen, to have fellowship with God, you, you come to God on God's terms and atonement always happens before fellowship. That, that's important for us to remember is that we, we just don't casually walk into the presence of God. There needs to be atonement for our sin. Our sin has to be dealt with and God has provided the, a way for that to happen. And so now since our sin has been atoned for, we, we can be in a relationship, a, a real relationship with God and, and God's people. And so since my sin is atoned for, I am reconciled and I can participate in this peace feast. And so <clears throat> for the next two weeks, uh, we'll talk about the compulsory offerings. And that is going to expand our picture of atonement. And so we have this progression, atonement, thanksgiving, and fellowship. And then God is going to uh, kind of go back and make sure we understand what happens during atonement. And so if you remember when we talked about the offerings at the very beginning, uh, there are five of those, but only three are sacrifices or offerings that provide atonement for sin. The, the burn offering, the Allah, and then we're going to talk about the purification offering and the, the ransom offering um, in the next two weeks. And those are also called the, the sin offering and the guilt offering. And so what we'll see is as God is talking about atonement for our sins, uh, he's talked about a, a covering that we needed. Uh, and we remember we talked about sunscreen that we would put on, and that allows us to be exposed to the sun. And the sun is a, a good thing, uh, but we need to be protected because the sun can also burn us, right? And so um, God is a good God. He's a loving God, uh, but He's also just, and He's righteous, and He's holy. And those attributes mean that we need to be protected. We need to have that covering to enter into His presence. And now uh, God over the next couple of weeks, is going to talk about atonement as purification. And so uh, that sin is messy. That sin um, kind of destroys and contaminates. And so it needs to be purified, and we need to be purified from sin. And then finally, he's going to, to teach us through the guilt offering uh, that sin is like a debt that we owe. Um, and so we need to, to a, a ransom needs to be paid. Uh, for us to come into God's presence. And so that's kind of the big picture of what is happening in these first uh, seven chapters of Leviticus. Um, so we'll talk about the, the concept of purification and ransom over the next couple of weeks. But this morning we're focusing on the peace offering. And Leviticus, again, uh, as we've seen with, with each of these, there are case laws uh, that God is going to give us and, and that's kind of what makes it complicated, right? Is because we, we read these and we say, okay, well, this is the same thing, but it's, it's a little bit different. And this is the same, but it's a little bit different. And it gets confusing because um, it, it does take a little bit of time uh, to kind of look at each of these individually and say, what's different? What's the same? What does this mean? And so here God starts with these three case laws. Um, and depending on if the animal came from the, the flock, or the herd, and so we're again dealing with either an animal from the herd would be a, a bull or a cow, uh, a bovine animal. Some places uh, it, it's translated as ox, and then also uh, from the herd would be a, a sheep or a goat. And so one difference here from the burnt offering uh, is that it could be a male or female. Uh, it still had to be without blemish. And remember when we're talking about being without blemish. Um, I want what comes to our mind to be the words properly functioning, okay? And, and the reason for that is we, we just left Ephesians, right? And we talked about um, being apocalypsis, uh, being these points of revelation for other people and talked about how uh, God is making a, a new humanity. And so in that hu new humanity, what God is wanting us to do as believers is function properly. He's, he's leading us into holiness. He's sanctifying us. He's changing our lives. And so this unblemished animal would be a uh, properly functioning animal. Uh, so it could not be lame. 
uh, could not be blind. It could not have uh, one leg longer than the other. Uh, couldn't have any kind of disease or anything like that. Uh, it had to be without blemish. Uh, another difference is the entire animal is not consumed. Uh, if you remember when we talked about the burn offering, uh, the Ola offering, the entire animal is offered to God and, and burned up on the altar. Uh, here, that's not the case. Uh, the offering is divided between three parties, uh, God, the priest, and then the offerer. Um, and it was the only offering the offerer could eat as part of a, a shared covenantal meal. We'll see with the, um, the purification offering and the reparation offering that the priest could eat parts of those depending on the, the case. Um, but here is the only offering that the offerer could participate and come to the table uh, with the priest and with God and share that fellowship. Uh, the most prominent feature here that we see repeated over and over has to do with the, the fat portions of the sacrifice. Uh, fat is mentioned 12 times to underscore, hey, this is important. Highlight, underline, bold print. Fat is what this offering is about for God. Uh, and it ends with uh, the last sentence that, that Chip read is, All fat uh, belongs to the Lord. Uh, as a statute forever, you shall neither eat fat nor blood. And so throughout the Old Testament, we have to say, okay, what is, what's up with the fat? What does this represent? What are we looking at here? What is God painting a, a picture for us? How is he, he doing that? Uh, throughout the Old Testament, fat represents richness. Fat represents the choicest parts of the animal. Uh, when Joseph is in Egypt in Genesis and um, he is in charge of handling the food and he's, his brothers come and, and all of that goes down, um, Pharaoh invites his family back to live in Egypt. And this is how he, he says that. Uh, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your beast and go back to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me. Come live with us. And I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you shall eat the fat of the land. And so that's the, the same idea uh, is this concept of the best, uh, the richest portions of the land. And Psalm 147 uh, the psalmist writes this, He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of, of wheat. Again, same word for fat that we find here in Leviticus. And so this is the choicest portions of the animal. And so if you're a, a food network junkie, uh, like I can be at times, uh, you know that a chef will admire uh, a piece of meat that's well marbled. He'll, he'll look. When, they're, when they say go uh, in Iron Chef and they're running to the pantry to collect their ingredients and they're picking out the, the steaks that they want, they're holding it up and looking at it and they say, yeah, this one's got a, a, a lot of marbling. It's got a, a lot of intramuscular fat. And so this is a good piece of meat. It's going to have a, a lot of flavor. Um, this is how, if you're a, a Guy Fieri fan, uh, this is how you get to Flavortown, right? You, you want the piece that has the, the fat marbled in it. Because that's where all the flavor is. And so fat is a, a big deal here. And notice there are three case laws, uh, but there's only two groups of animals. Uh, he talks about animals from the flock or the herd, but then there's, there's three case laws. Uh, the procedure for the, the bovine animals, the cows, the ox, um, it's the same as identical to what we find for the goat and the sheep. Uh, except for one difference. When we are dealing with the, the sheep, there's something that um, may have stood out in your mind. As he was reading this, I know as I studied it, uh, I had to, to do some searching because I was like, what are you talking about, God? Um, but there's a reason, there's a, a difference here. Um, the anatomy of these animals is different. And so you, when we, we read the, par the part about the sheep, uh, it talks about the fat from the tail. Um, and... We see that these sheep have a, a large portion of fat on their tails. And I know you're thinking, same thing I am. What are you talking about? Well, if I go to a, a field, if I've seen some sheep, I know you've seen sheep at probably petting zoos, or uh, I think Micah and Leanne, you, you guys used to have sheep, right? Yeah, and, and they didn't have, like, would you say there's a big bunch of fat on their tail? Like, no, we wouldn't think that. And that's because the sheep that we have in America... Uh, are a different breed than what they have overseas. Um, and so this is a long tail or a fat tail sheep, okay? Um, feel free to insert your own Sir Mix-a-Lot joke. Um, 
But there's about 28 pounds of fat on these sheep's tails, right? And, and in Middle Eastern countries, this is actually a, a delicacy. And so mm-hmm. they will take these sheep and, and butcher them, and they'll, they'll use the, the fat to make a confit. Uh, so they'll mince up some sheep meat and put it in uh, fat that has been rendered down and, and kind of use it like a spread. Uh, and then there are other instances that I found uh, where they will just slice the fat and eat it raw for breakfast, um, kind of like sheep bacon. Um, and so this is like a, a big del- delicacy uh, over there. And so God is, is saying, uh, here is the, the richest portion, the choicest, most flavorful uh, part of the animal. And all of this is what is burned up on the altar as a food offering to God. And again, uh, we see this kind of anthropomorphism where uh, God is, is being made relatable to us. And so when we think about the king and his royal palace and, and we're going to dinner with the king, um, since he is the king, uh, our reverence and uh, our respect dictates that he gets the best portion. Uh, I was reading a, a commentary and it, it's, kind of explained it like this. Um, A school classroom, the teacher asked the kids what love is. And one of the kids put down for their answer that love is when uh, mom cooks and dad comes home a little bit later for work and mom, mommy has saved the, the biggest chicken leg for daddy. Uh, that's what love is. And so that's, that's kind of what we're seeing here is that he's the king. Uh, he's done so much for us. Uh, he's worthy of honor. He's worthy of respect. And so he gets the choicest portions. And so, again, the, the fat is given to God. And uh, notice that it is separated from the entrails. And so, again, we have this distinction and, and see the idea of separation uh, between what is clean and, and what is um, good, what is uh, being made holy and the fat is offered, but also the, the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver. And so I, I don't want to over-allegorize what's going on here. Uh, but again, we, we can ask the question, why, why the interest in the, the kidneys and the, the long lobe of the liver? Um, we know that the organs of an animal, uh, we, we call that the offal. And we know they're some of the most nutrient-rich portions of an animal and so you think of the, the kidneys, the heart, uh, those, those are full of nutrients and, and um, very filling foods. Uh, but there is some symbolism here uh, that I, I just want to insert for reflection. Uh, the word kidneys is used elsewhere in Scripture to, to mean our inner being. And so in Psalm sixteen seven, uh, the psalmist writes, I will bless the Lord who guides me even at night. My heart, literally in Hebrew it says, my kidneys, uh, instruct me. And so the, the inner self of the psalmist is what is being talked about here. And then Proverbs twenty three sixteen we see the same word. Uh, and my kidneys, my inmost being, will rejoice when your lips speak what is right. And so remember the, the peace offering also includes the hand ride. And so just like the, the burn offering where the offerer would uh, lay their hand on the animal and say, this, hand, th- this animal uh, represents me. Um, during the peace offering, the offerer would lay their hand on the animal and, and this offering, uh, this animal represents me. And, and so God, I'm offering you my innermost being, my kidneys. We would say uh, in today's language, someone has my heart. Uh, it's our seed of affection and devotion, the, the innermost part of, of who we are, the depths of who we are. And so the offer is designating uh, this animal represents me and God, I'm giving you not only the richest, the choicest portions uh, of my life, but I'm also I'm, I'm giving you my inner self. I'm giving you who I am. And then we can look at the lobe of the liver um, and in ancient Near Eastern culture uh, that is surrounding Israel um, it is used as a means of divination, of trying to foretell the, the future, of trying to uh, predict what will happen or um, give a, a reason for someone to make a certain judgment, uh, kind of like maybe flipping a coin, heads or tails, we would think of what should I do um, in this situation. And so uh, in Ezekiel, we see this used this way. 
Um, the king is uh, the king of Babylon stands at the parting of of the way, uh, at the head of two ways. So he's standing at a, a fork in the road uh, to use divination. He shakes the arrows. He consults the household idols. He looks at the liver. And so people in ancient Near Eastern cultures would um, gut an animal. And you've probably seen this on on television shows uh, where they take part of the organs and they will put them in a bowl and and they'll say, well, I can see this is going to happen in your future, king. And uh, so that's how they would kind of try to predict the future. And so, again, I I don't want to make something out of nothing here, but it's very possible um, that this is uh, a symbolism of us entrusting uh, our future, entrusting ourselves to God's sovereignty uh, to God's judgment and His plans for our lives. And so I, I don't need to try to figure out this, uh, what's going to happen on my own. I, I give this to God, and I'm going to, to trust God and what He has in store for my life. And so what happens with the rest of the meat? Uh, Leviticus 3, everything that we read this morning is all about God's portion. It's about the fat and the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver. Uh, but then Leviticus 7 11 through 36 is kind of the back side of this. Um, I, I think it's so cool that we're, we're going through these five offerings and we've gone through seven chapters because, again, there's a, a front side here where we talk about the responsibility of the offer and what's going on with the offer. And then on the back side, uh, we have the regulations for the priest and, and what they are responsible for. And so Leviticus 11 through 37, 11 through 36 is where we are told what portions are for the priest and for the offerer. And again, there are three case laws, uh, three variations. I'm not going to to read that, but this is kind of your homework, and and this will be a commentary on that. Uh, There are three case laws, uh, three variations or occasions for the peace offering. And so first it could be giving as an offering of thanksgiving, a, a thank offering. And so these were offered by someone who had a near-death experience. And so we can read in the Talmud and Barakat 54b, uh, they write, There are four who are required to bring a thanksgiving offering, one who traverses the sea, one who crosses a desert, one who was ill and recovered, and one who was imprisoned and released. And so the idea is if you went through one of these four circumstances, um, you were considered to have a, a near-death experience. And so um, since you survived that, you were to bring a, a thank offering, a, a peace offering to God. And that's what we see described in Psalm 107, um, verses 20 through 24. Uh, it says, He sent out His word, God sent out His word and healed them, snatching them from the door of death. Let them praise the Lord for His great love and for the wonderful things He has done for them. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and sing joyfully about His glorious acts. Some went off to sea in ships, playing, plying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, His impressive works on the deepest seas. And so, again, the idea is that you've, you've been through this near-death experience, this thing that you shouldn't have survived, and God has been gracious to you. And so you bring this thanksgiving uh, peace offering to God. And so for this offering, the offerer would uh, also bring bread, uh, kind of like today. Um, when we have a meal, you often hear people say, well, I'm a, a meat and potatoes kind of guy. And so with these uh, peace feasts, uh, there would often be meat and bread. And in the case of the thanks offering, um, there would be both meat and bread. And so there were four kinds of, of bread that were presented um, when the offerer would come, uh, 10 loaves of, of each kind. So we're talking about 40 loaves of, of bread. Uh, they were to bring 10 unleavened loaves, 10 unleavened wafers or kind of matzah bread. Um, and I don't remember if, if, if you remember communion and I, I had the matzah. Uh, those were like really big sheets, like eight and a half, 11 piece of paper, really big sheets of, of matzah bread. These are not little crackers. And so uh, 10 loaves of, of matzah, then they would bring 10 and 11 loaves of boiled flour. Um, and you can kind of think of that maybe as like a, a bagel uh, or a donut kind of, of thing uh, that they would bring. And then they were also to bring leavened loaves. And it's very important to kind of clarify here um, that these were not offered on the altar um, because when we talked about the 
the gift offering, the grain offering last week, um, no leaven is ever to, to come on the altar. It's never to be burned on the altar because it represents sin, right? And so uh, what they did with these loaves is give them as a gift to God that was to be received um, by the priest. And so um, they would give one loaf of, of each type of bread uh, to, the, to the priest, to the officiating priest, and that, that would leave the offerer with the, the 36 uh, remaining loaves. And so the one loaf that they, uh, of each that they gave to the priest could be eaten by the priest and his family, and then the remaining loaves could be eaten by the offerer and their friends and family. And so uh, they brought the bread and the flesh of the animal. Uh, the meat is also divided in a very specific way. Uh, we've already seen that God gets the fat, uh, the kidneys, the choice portions of the animal, uh, but the priests also have assigned portions. And so the, the right thigh, the shok, uh, is giving to the officiating priest who is the one that would be sprinkling the blood, manipulating the, the blood during the ritual. And then the breast, the hazi, uh, is given to the assisting priest that, that helped uh, during this ceremony. Um, and then there's also some time constraints uh, placed on these offerings. Uh, the food from the thank offering could be eaten on the same day. That's it. Uh, the day you offered the thank offering, you had to eat all the food, um, and whatever was left over was not consumed the next day. Uh, you discarded of that. Uh, and then the food from the vow or free will offering, and I'll backpedal here in a second, um, those could be eaten on the first or the second day. So you could either eat that on the day that you offered it, or you could eat it uh, the next day. And so uh, describing the, the vow and the free will offering, uh, neither of these required bread. Uh, the thank offering is the only offering here of the peace offerings that required bread. Uh, but we do see occasions in the Old Testament where the vow and the free will offering um, are paired with bread, but it wasn't required. And so uh, the vow offering is given when a specific prayer request was answered in your life. And so the idea was, God, if, if you do X, then I will do Y. I'll, I'll give you a vow offering when you answer this prayer. And, and so occasions we can think of that happening is uh, Hannah in 1 Samuel, when she's praying for a son, uh, and God answers her prayer, she would bring a, a vow offering uh, and present that as a way of saying thank you. Uh, in Numbers 6, we see the descriptions for uh, those that would undertake a, a Nazarite vow, and that's just separating yourself even uh, more for God's purposes, um, being more dedicated and devoted to God in how you lived your life. Um, stricter requirements than what the common Israelite would face in a, uh, their daily life. And so upon answering that prayer request or upon completion of that vow, um, the Nazarite vow, you would present a vow offering to God. And then a free will offering, uh, the simplest way to think of a, a free will offering is that it is a voluntary uh, dedication offering to God. And so in the book of Ezra, when the exiles return to Judah, uh, they are asked to bring and present free will offerings to help them uh, to rebuild the temple, right? And in Exodus uh, chapter 35, as the, God has given the people instructions for the tabernacle, um, we, we see that a free will offering is given, and it's not necessarily animals. Um, it's precious gold, it's, it's precious gems, it's fine linen that were uh, used to, to make the tabernacle. And so um, the free will offering uh, is an offering given to God to benefit the service uh, that would take place at the tabernacle or the, the temple. And so in the Hebrew, uh, the word is trumah, uh, and it means a uh, contribution. Uh, the root of that is, is to lift up. And so it is also the word used to describe the right thigh that the, the priest is given. Uh, the officiating priest would be given that right thigh. Um, and that is offered to him as a, a heave offering. And so the idea is that uh, he would take that right thigh and he would uh, lift it up to God. And then he would bring it back down and receive that. And it was a sign of his dependency on God. Uh, for his, for God to sustain his life. 
And then the, the breast meat um, is often called the wave offering. And so you may have heard those two uh, terms, and that's the tnufa. That's a hard word to say. Um, and so that's the, the wave offering. And so what would happen is the offerer would hold the, the breast meat in their hands. Um, the priest would put their hands under the person offering the meat, and they would wave that back and forth horizontally in front of the altar. And so that represented God's presence among His people, that He is having uh, fellowship with them during this peace feast. And so hopefully you can see um, when you have this heave offering and this wave offering, uh, you, we get this symbol of, of the cross, right, uh, that happens during this offering. Um, and so the purpose of the peace offering it's very important, again, to, for me to reiterate. This offering is not for atonement, but it was burned on top of the morning uh, burnt offering. So atonement happens before fellowship. Um, but it is a feast. It's a celebration. It's celebrating that atonement has been provided, um, that we can be reconciled and restored, um, have fellowship with the king, we can live uh, as citizens of God's kingdom in uh, His presence, um, that He will, will dwell among us and we can enjoy that fellowship. It is a covenantal communal meal for the citizens of the kingdom. And so when you slaughter a bull, uh, when you slaughter a goat or a sheep, um, that's a lot of food. I don't know if any of you have ever slaughtered a cow or butchered, had a cow butchered for steaks and meat, um, but you end up with a lot. Uh, you end up with more than one person definitely could eat by theirself. Uh, you end up with more than one family uh, could eat in one sitting by theirself. And so um, that's kind of the point of this, uh, that this animal would provide so much food and, and you're baking 40 loaves of, of bread uh, and that's going to make a lot of sandwiches. Uh, we had family night on, on Wednesday and I think uh, we had about 65 people or so there and I, I think we went through about five loaves of bread, six loaves of bread and, and that was good. But we're, we're talking about 40 loaves um, and so that's a lot of meat and that's a lot of bread uh, that's a, a big meal. And so God's design is that this would be eaten with, with friends, that this would be, be eaten with um, your neighbors, your friends, other people, um, even people that uh, may have fallen on hard times and, and needed food. And so they're invited to uh, participate in this meal. And so that's why there is this uh, time constraint that God puts on the meal uh, because he, he wants it to be shared. He wants it to be a communal celebration, a community event. And so um, there are no doggy bags. There's no to-go boxes uh, at the peace feast. You, you, you come and we all celebrate and we get rid of all of this food at, at one sitting. And it's a, a big celebration of our fellowship with the king. And so we see in Deuteronomy 12, it says, You may... Not eat within your towns the tithe of your grain or your wine or of your oil of the, or the firstborn of your herd or of your flock or any of your vow offerings that you vow or your free will offerings or the contribution that you present. But you shall eat them before the Lord. Again, emphasizing God's here. This is God's presence with us. Your God in the place that the Lord your God will choose you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant and Levite who is within your towns, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in all that you undertake. And it's a pleasing aroma to God. He loves you. He wants fellowship with you. And when He smells the grill being started, He's, mm, that smells good. I'm going to get to see my people. I'm going to get to spend time with the people that I care about, the citizens of my kingdom. Guys, as, as Christians, we should be enjoying the fellowship and the celebration of this relationship that God has made possible. In Acts, in the early church, we see the church meeting together often in homes, praying and breaking bread. And so we see this idea of a communal meal, celebration, and then there are also occasions when we 
collectively come to the Lord's table for communion. And again, we see this kind of echo because communion doesn't save us, right? It's not what saves us. What saves us is atonement through Jesus' blood, but communion is remembrance of that. As we feast and have fellowship, we can have that fellowship with God. Augustine uh, said that communion is formed by uh, the prefix com, which means together, and then the suffix union from unity. And so uh, the way I like to see it is it's community unity. Um, it, it's a family meal. It's coming together as citizens of God's kingdom. We're reconciled with, with God. Um, Jesus is, is who we have in common with each other, regardless of what we do for our careers, what, regardless of what gender we are, regardless of our skin color. We have Jesus in common as our Savior. And so we are united by Him. Even if we have different interests and hobbies and, and different things going on in our life, we can be uh, united by Jesus and what He has done for us. And so we share a meal with all kinds of different people because of what Jesus has done for us. And in Leviticus, anyone who is invited to this meal, um, if Keith was offering a peace offering, he could invite anyone he wanted, and they could come and eat and participate in this meal. The only requirement was that you had to be ritually clean. You had to be qualified to come to the table. Your sin had to be atoned for, and you had to be in a ritually pure state. If you were unclean, you weren't cut off from the people, and that's important for us to hear. If you weren't ritually poor, you weren't cut off from the people. You just couldn't participate in that meal at that time. If you ate while you were unclean, then you would be cut off from the people. And So there is a connection even here that we need to see um, in the New Testament. This is why Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is writing to a body of believers and he's saying, listen guys, this is a peace peace feast. This is a a communal celebration. You guys are family. You're you're fellow believers. You're you're united in Jesus. But there's all this division that I'm seeing. There's all this division that I'm hearing about. There's no fellowship here. Some of them were gluttonous while others were going hungry. Some of them were going off by themselves and and not associating with other people at the table. And his warning is, examine yourself. His warning is, don't eat and drink without discerning the body. And Paul's not talking about our physical body. When he says, look, there's division among you, and this is supposed to be a community uh, event for people that are united in Christ. Don't come to the table without discerning the body. He's talking about how we interact with one another. He's talking about are we considering each other? Are we considering the body of Christ, which is the the church, right? And so he says, are you partaking of the peace feast while there's strife and division in your midst? If that's the case, you bring judgment on yourself because you're being hypocritical. You aren't at peace. You aren't in unity. And you're diminishing the symbol of the communal meal. This is supposed to represent fellowship and peace with God, but it's also supposed to represent fellowship and peace with our brothers and sisters. And Jay Sklar in his commentary says this way, Think of it this way, For a groom to eat his wedding cake while being in the midst of an affair makes a mockery of that cake. In the same way, for Christians to partake of the Lord's Supper while mistreating other covenant brothers and sisters makes a mockery of that covenant meal and what it represents. The fact, the sacrificial blood and body of Christ which we enter into covenant relationship with Him and with each other, brothers and sisters united by Christ. And again, in the New Testament, we see um, this is the way that they will know you're my disciple, right? Right? It's, it's not by the size of your congregation. It's not by your youth group programs. 
It's not by the size of your offering. It's that you love one another. And that love and that unity is supposed to be this telling symbol to the world that, hey, there's something special here. And, and if you think about it, um, that is special. Because dealing with other people is hard. And, and you can say amen. I mean, it is. Because none of us are perfect. And, and it takes some give and take. It takes some sacrifice. It takes being lenient and gracious to, to get along with one another. To have that love for one another and to say, hey, you know, even though you rub me the wrong way sometimes, I, I love you, and we need each other. We, we, we are dependent on each other. So there's a, a lot of rich symbolism here, and hopefully this will, will lead to some, some good conversations between um, our Sunday school classes or in your, your daily conversations with each other. Um, but the main theme is, is that of, of fellowship and, and peace, and so primarily do we have um, a relationship, we have fellowship with God, with our Creator, um, but don't neglect the secondary question of, of how is my fellowship with my brothers and sisters? How is my fellowship with other believers? And Jesus talks about how important this is in, in the book of Matthew. He says, that if you're offering your gift at the altar... And there you remember that your brother has something against you. If you've wronged them, if there's some conflict or tension, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. And we'll see this verse again over the next couple of weeks because it's, it's so crucial uh, of being an identifying factor of, of part of the fruit of knowing Jesus. So... I'll just leave you with this. Have you, have you wronged someone in some way? Um, if that's the case, apologize. Be reconciled. Make things right. And then, is there an interest in the lives of other people around you? Is there an empathy towards those in our local church body? Uh, are we intentional? Do we, we, do we try to, to keep up with what's going on in other people's lives so we can... Rejoice when they rejoice and, and weep when they weep? Um, or do we try to kind of disappear in the crowd? Because we, we really should be trying to, to create and cultivate um, our relationships with, with each other. And that looks um, different for, for everybody. Um, just making intentional contact, saying, hey, how can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? Checking up on each other. Um, and being involved. Because a, a lack of fellowship, guys, it, it interrupts our, our worship. Um, it inhibits our ability to serve. And it impedes our, our spiritual growth. Um, because we, we do. We, we need each other. Um, and God is drawing our attention to that through the peace feast.